normal. If you're fully vaccinated and you're outdoors and not in a big crowd, you no longer need to wear a mask. Thanking Americans for getting us here. And moments from now, President Joe Biden lays out his hopes for the future. Restoring trust between law enforcement and the community they are sworn to serve and protect. Racism has long torn us apart. We have so many people dying every single day from gun violence in America. The vast majority of people crossing the border are being sent back. We desperately need a unified national response to the climate crisis. America is back. Diplomacy is back. Tonight, how will his message play to a divided Congress, to a polarized America? Now reporting, David Muir. And good evening from ABC News headquarters in New York. Just moments from now, President Biden will address Congress and the American people on the eve of his first 100 days in office. Let's look live now at the House chamber. The president set to arrive moments from now. Members of Congress already arriving. We know President Biden entered office at a time of historic challenge in our country. This once in a century pandemic, 574,000 lives now lost to the virus. Senator Sanders there. Millions of jobs lost, and the president's address tonight will reflect the times we're in. Far fewer people in the House chamber. Senator Klobuchar making her entrance. About 200 lawmakers and guests. There are usually about eight times that, 1,600 people. But they will social distance. They'll wear masks. You see it all right there. We're joined here in New York by our powerhouse team, Martha Raddatz, Lindsay Davis, Cecilia Vega, John Carl. And we all know that Mary Bruce is actually in the chamber tonight. So we wanted to check in with Mary first right out of the gate here. Mary, you've been to these addresses before. So give us a sense of just how different this already is tonight. David, it is just bizarre and surreal. You know, normally right now this chamber would be bustling and boisterous. Instead, this is a very subdued scene. I mean, at times there's been almost a hushed library-like feeling. A soft din as lawmakers have been chatting and catching up. One of the most striking things though, I have to tell you is that center aisle. You know, normally members line up for hours jockeying for a coveted spot there on the edge to have that moment with the president. Well, now those seats are actually technically empty. They want to discourage those handshakes Though we have seen some fist bumps and elbow bumps. All the seats, of course, here are socially distanced, assigned to specific lawmakers. I am now one of just 200 people here. Of course, no full Congress, no full cabinet here tonight. No need for that designated survivor. We've seen the first lady and second gentleman arrive. They're actually sitting in a row all to themselves. And of course, David, all eyes will be on that dais where history, of course, will be made here tonight for the first time. Two women, the vice president, the house speaker, they're over the president's shoulder. And there they are, the live picture coming in tonight. That is history already being made this evening and we wanted to show you an image just before we came on the air tonight of the moment that the vice president Kamala Harris arrived there in the chamber being brought up to the dais and the speaker of the house Nancy Pelosi who made history herself the first woman speaker and of course all the history of Lindsay Davis that Kamala Harris has made and the two of them now stand there together Oh, again, so much that visually looks different uh, about tonight, as Mary said, with the masking, the social distancing. But I have to imagine that chief among all these differences is that you're going to have two women framed that entire time in a shot. It appears they're getting ready for General William Walker. Sergeant at Arms, his first time making this announcement. Madam Speaker, the President of the United States. All right, they're doing some fist bumps there. You can see they're trying to adjust with the moment. You saw Dr. Jill Biden up there in the gallery. It's something quite different. Cecilia Vega is that the first lady is up there, not with the typical guests you would see. Uh, she's up there alone. But I have to tell you, a lot more energy in the room than many, I think, were expecting, knowing there'd just be 200 people in the room. That first lady's box is not there this year, David. And you know, in that first lady's box, normally you see guests of, of people that the president wants to highlight, issues the president wants to highlight in his speech. They are not there, those guests tonight, but the First Lady did hold virtual sessions today with multiple people, among them uh, a DACA, a young DACA recipient, those young people who were brought to this country illegally as children. That certainly is going to be an issue that the President is talking about tonight, going to push this Congress to make some moves, a big picture moves on immigration reform. There you see the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and now approaching the history at the dais is Vice President Kamala Harris, the Speaker of the House. And he's expected to 
make mention of this history. How could you not? With it on full display right there behind him. Handing a copy of the speech. Thanks for having me. Okay. Members of Congress, I have the high privilege and distinct honor to present to you the President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good to be back. Uh, Mitch and Chuck will understand it's good to be almost home. Down the hall. <laughs> anyway, thank you all. Madam Speaker, Madam Vice President. No president has ever said those words from this podium. No president has ever said those words. And it's about time. First Lady, I'm her husband. Second gentleman, Chief Justice, members of the United States Congress and the Cabinet, distinguished guests, my fellow Americans, while the uh, setting tonight is familiar, this gathering is just a little bit different. A reminder of the extraordinary times we're in. Throughout our history, presidents have come to this chamber to speak to Congress, to the nation, and to the world, to declare war, to celebrate peace, to announce new plans and possibilities. Tonight, I come to talk about crisis and opportunity, about rebuilding the nation, revitalizing our democracy, and winning the future for America. I stand here tonight one day shy of the 100th day of my administration, 100 days since I took the oath of office and lifted my hand off our family Bible and inherited a nation we all did that was in crisis, the worst pandemic in a century, the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression, the worst attack on our democracy since the Civil War. Now, after just 100 days, I can report to the nation, America is on the move again. <laughs> Turning peril into possibility, crisis to opportunity, setbacks into strength. We all know Life can knock us down, but in America, we never, ever, ever stay down. Americans always get up. Today, that's what we're doing. America's rising anew, choosing hope over fear, truth over lies, and light over darkness. After 100 days of rescue and renewal, America is ready for a takeoff, in my view. We're working again, dreaming again, discovering again, and leading the world again. We have shown each other and the world that there's no quit in America, none. 100 days ago, America's house was on fire. We had to act. And thanks to the extraordinary leadership of Speaker Pelosi, Majority Leader Schumer, and the overwhelming support of the American people, Democrats, Independents, and Republicans, we did act. Together, we passed the American Rescue Plan, one of the most consequential rescue packages in American history. We're already seeing the results. We're already seeing the results.
after I promised we'd get 100 million COVID-19 vaccine shots into people's arms in 100 days, we will have provided over 220 million COVID shots in those 100 days. Thanks to all the help of all of you. We're marshalling, with your help, everyone's help, we're marshalling every federal resource. We've gotten vaccines to nearly 40,000 pharmacies and over 700 community health centers where the poorest of the poor can be reached. We're setting up community vaccination sites, developing mobile units to get to hard-to-reach communities. Today, 90 percent of Americans now live within five miles of a vaccination site. Everyone over the age of 16, everyone is now eligible to get vaccinated right now, right away. Go get vaccinated, America. Go and get the vaccination. They're available. They're eligible now. When I was sworn in on January 20th, less than 1 percent of the seniors in America were fully vaccinated against COVID-19. 100 days later, 70 percent of seniors in America, over 65, are protected, fully protected. Senior deaths from COVID-19 are down 80 percent since January, down 80 percent because of all of you. And more than half of all the adults in America have gotten at least one shot. A mass vaccination center in Glendale, Arizona, I asked the nurse, I said, what's it like? She looked at me and she said, it's like every shot is giving a dose of hope. Was her phrase, a dose of hope. A dose of hope for an educator in Florida who has a child suffering from an autoimmune disease. Wrote to me, said she's worried, that she was worried about bringing the virus home. She said she then got vaccinated at a, at a large site in her car. She said she sat in her car when she got vaccinated and just cried. Cried out of joy and cried out of relief. Parents, seeing the smiles on their kids' faces for those who are able to go back to school because the teachers and school bus drivers and cafeteria workers have been vaccinated. Grandparents hugging their children and grandchildren instead of pressing hands against the window to say goodbye. It means everything. Those things mean everything. You know, there's still, you all know it, you know it better than any group of Americans, there's still more work to do to beat this virus. We can't let our guard down. But tonight, I can say, t because of you, the American people, our progress these past 100 days against one of the worst pandemics in history has been one of the greatest logistical achievements, logistical achievements this country's ever seen. What else have we done in those first 100 days? We kept our commitment, Democrats and Republicans, of sending $1,400 rescue checks to 85 percent of American households. We already sent more than 160 million checks out the door. It's making a difference. You all know it when you go home. For many people, it's making all the difference in the world. A single mom in Texas who wrote me, she said she couldn't work. But she said the relief check put food on the table and saved her and her son from eviction from their apartment. A grandmother in Virginia who told me she immediately took her granddaughter to the eye doctor, something she said she put off for months because she didn't have the money. One of the defining images, at least from my perspective in this crisis, has been cars lined up, cars lined up for miles. And not, not people just barely able to start those cars, nice cars lined up for miles, waiting for a box of food to be put in their trunk. I don't know about you, but I didn't ever think I'd see that in America. And all of this is through no fault of their own. 
with no fault of their own, these people are in this position. That's why the rescue plan is delivering food and nutrition assistance to millions of Americans facing hunger. And hunger's down sharply already. We're also providing rental assistance. You all know this, but the American people, I want to make sure they understand. Keeping people from being evicted from their homes. Providing loans to small businesses that reopen and keep their employees on the job. During these 100 days, an additional 800,000 Americans enrolled in the Affordable Care Act when I established a special sign-up period to do that. 800,000 in that period. We're making one of the largest one-time ever investments, ever, in improving health care for veterans. Critical investments to address the opioid crisis. And maybe most importantly, thanks to the American Rescue Plan, we're on track to cut child poverty in America in half this year. And in the process, while this is all going on, the economy created more than 1,300,000 new jobs in 100 days. More jobs in the first <laughs> more jobs in the first hundred days than any president on record. The International Monetary Fund <laughs> the International Monetary Fund is now estimating our economy will grow at a rate of more than six percent this year. That will be the fastest pace of economic growth in this country in nearly four decades. America's moving, moving forward, but we can't stop now. We're in competition with China and other countries to win the 21st century. We're at a great inflection point in history. We have to do more than just build back better. We, build back, we have to build back better. We have to compete more strenuously than we have. Throughout our history, if you think about it, public investment in infrastructure has literally transformed America, our attitudes as well as our opportunities. The Transcontinental Railroad, the interstate highways, united two oceans and brought a totally new age of progress to the United States of America. Universal public schools and college aid opened wide the doors of opportunity. Scientific breakthroughs took us to the moon. Now we're on Mars discovering vaccines, gave us the internet, and so much more. These are investments we made together as one country, and investments that only the government was in a position to make. Time and again, they propel us into the future. That's why I propose the American Jobs Plan a once-in-a-generation investment in America itself. This is the largest jobs plan since World War II. It creates jobs to upgrade our transportation infrastructure. Jobs modernizing our roads, bridges, highways. Jobs building ports and airports, rail corridors, transit lines. It's clean water, and today, up to 10 million homes in America and more than 400,000 schools and child care centers have pipes with lead in them, including drinking water. A clear and present danger to our children's health. American Jobs Plan creates jobs replacing 100 percent of the nation's lead pipes and service lines so every American can drink clean water. And the process will create thousands and thousands of good-paying jobs. It creates jobs connecting every American with high-speed Internet, including 35 percent of the rural America that still doesn't have it. This is going to help our kids and our businesses succeed in the 21st century economy. And I'm asking the Vice President to lead this effort, if she would.
because I know it will get done. <laughs> Creates jobs building a modern power grid. Our grids are vulnerable to storms, hacks, catastrophic failures with tight, tragic results as we saw in Texas and elsewhere during the winter storms. The American Jobs Plan will create jobs that lay thousands of miles of transmission lines needed to build a resilient and fully clean grid. We can do that. Look, the American Jobs Plan will help millions of people get back to their jobs and back to their careers. Two million women have dropped out of the workforce during this pandemic. Two million. And too often because they couldn't get the care they needed to care for their child or care for an elderly parent who needs help. 800,000 families are on the Medicare waiting list right now to get home care for their aging parent or loved one with disability. If you think it's not important, check out in your own district, Democrat or Republican, Democrat or Republican voters. Their great concern, almost as much as their children, is taking care of an elderly loved one who can't be left alone. Medicaid contemplated it, but this plan is going to help those families and create jobs for our caregivers with better wages and better benefits continuing the cycle of growth. For too long, we've failed to use the most important word when it comes to meeting the climate crisis. Jobs. 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 For me, when I think climate change, I think jobs. The American Jobs Plan will put engineers and construction workers to work building more energy efficient buildings and homes. Electrical workers, IBEW members, installing 500,000 charging stations along our highways so we can own, so we can own the electric car market. Farmers, farmers planting cover crops so they can reduce the carbon dioxide in the air and get paid for doing it. Look, think about it. There is simply no reason why the blades for wind turbines can't be built in Pittsburgh instead of Beijing. No reason. None. No reason. So, folks, There's no reason why American, American workers can't lead the world in the production of electric vehicles and batteries. I mean, there is no reason. We have this capacity. We're the brightest, best trained people in the world. The American Jobs Plan is going to create millions of good paying jobs, jobs Americans can raise a family on. As my dad would then say, with a little breathing room. And all the investments in the American Job Plan will be guided by one principle, buy American. <laughs> buy American. And I might note parenthetically, that does, not, that does not violate any trade agreement. It's been the law since the 30s, buy American. American tax dollars are going to be used to buy American products made in America to create American jobs. That's the way it's supposed to be, and it will be in this administration. And I made it clear to all my cabinet people, their ability to give exemptions has been strenuously limited. It will be American products. Now, I know some of you at home are wondering whether these jobs are for you. So many of you, so many of the folks I grew up with, feel left behind, forgotten, in an economy that's so rapidly changing. It's frightening. 
I want to speak directly to you. Because you think about it. That's what people are most worried about. Can I fit in? Independent experts estimate the American jobs plan will add millions of jobs and trillions of dollars to economic growth in the years to come. It is a it is a eight-year program. These are good-paying jobs that can't be outsourced. Nearly 90 percent of the infrastructure jobs created in the American Jobs Plan do not require a college degree. 75 percent don't require an associate's degree. The American Jobs Plan is a blue-collar blueprint to build America. That's what it is. And it recognizes something I've always said in this chamber and the other. Good guys and women on Wall Street, but Wall Street didn't build this country. The middle class built the country, and unions built the middle class. So that's why I'm calling on Congress to pass Protect the Right to Organize Act, the PRO Act, and send it to my desk so we can support the right to unionize. And by the way, while you're thinking about sending things to my desk, <laughs> let's raise the minimum wage to $15. No one, no one working 40 hours a week no one working 40 hours a week should live below the poverty line. We need to ensure greater equity and opportunity for women. And while we're doing this, let's get the Paycheck Fairness Act to my desk as well, equal pay. It's been much too long. And if you wonder whether it's too long, look behind me. And finally, American Jobs Plan will be the biggest increase in non-defense research and development on record. We'll see more technological change, and some of you know more about this than I do. We'll see more technological change in the next 10 years than we saw in the last 50. That's how rapidly artificial intelligence and so much more is changing. And we're falling behind the competition with the rest of the world. Decades ago, we used to invest 2% of our gross domestic product in America. 2% of our gross domestic product in research and development. Today, Mr. Secretary, that's less than 1%. China and other countries are closing in fast. We have to develop and dominate the products and technologies of the future. Advanced batteries, biotechnology, computer chips, clean energy, the Secretary of Defense can tell you, and those of you who work in national security issues know, the De Defense Department has an agency called DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. The people who set up before I came here, and that's been a long time ago, to develop breakthroughs that enhance our national security. That's their only job. And it's a semi-separate agency. It's under the Defense Department. It's led to everything from the discovery of the internet to GPS and so much more that's enhanced our security. The National Institute of Health, the NIH, I believe, should create a similar advanced research projects agency for health. And that would, here's what it would do. It would have a singular purpose to develop breakthroughs to prevent, detect, and treat diseases like Alzheimer's, diabetes, and cancer. I'll still never forget when we passed the cancer proposal in the last year as Vice President. Almost $9 million going to NIH. And if excuse the point of personal privilege, I'll never forget you standing, Mitch, and saying, name it after my deceased son. It meant a lot. But so many of us have to see sons, daughters, and relatives who died of cancer. 
I can think of no more worthy investment. I know of nothing that is more bipartisan. So let's end cancer as we know it. It's within our power. It's within our power to do it. Investments in jobs and infrastructure, like the ones we're talking about, have often had bipartisan support in the past. Vice President Harris and I met regularly in the Oval Office with Democrats and Republicans and discussed the jobs plan. And I applaud a group of Republican senators who just put forward their own proposal. So let's get to work. I wanted to lay out before the Congress my plan before we got into the deep discussions. I'd like to meet with those who have ideas that are different, they think are better. I welcome those ideas. But the rest of the world is not waiting for us. And I just want to be clear. From my perspective, doing nothing is not an option. Look. We can't be so busy competing with one another that we forget the competition that we have with the rest of the world to win the 21st century. The Secretary Blinken can tell you, I spent a lot of time with President Xi. Traveled over 17,000 miles with him. Spent, they tell me, over 24 hours in private discussions with him. When he called to congratulate him, we had a two-hour discussion. He's deadly earnest about becoming the most significant consequential nation in the world. He and others, autocrats, think that democracy can't compete in the 21st century with autocracies because it takes too long to get consensus. To win that competition for the future, in my view, we also need to make a once-in-a-generation investment in our families and our children. That's why I've introduced the American Families Plan tonight, which addresses four of the biggest challenges facing American families and, in turn, America. First is access to good education. When this nation made 12 years of public education universal in the last century, it made us the best educated, best prepared nation in the world. It's, I believe, the overwhelming reason that propelled us to where we got in the 21st, in the 20th century. But the world's caught up or catching up. They're not waiting. I would say parenthetically, if we were sitting down, we set a bipartisan committee together and said, okay, we're going to decide what we do in terms of government providing for free education. I wonder whether we'd think, as we did in the 20th century, that 12 years is enough in the 21st century. I doubt it. 12 years is no longer enough today to compete with the rest of the world in the 21st century. That's why my American Families Plan guarantees four additional years of public education for every person in America starting as early as we can. The great universities in this country have conducted studies of the last 10 years. It shows that adding two years of universal high-quality preschool for every three-year-old and four-year-old, no matter what background they come from, puts them in a position to be able to compete all the way through 12 years and increases exponentially their prospect of graduating and going on beyond graduation. The research shows when a young child goes to school, not daycare, they're far more likely to graduate from high school and go to college or something after high school. When you add two years of free community college on top of that, you begin to change the dynamic. We can do that. And we'll increase Pell Grants and invest in historical black colleges and universities, tribal colleges, minority-serving institutions. The reason is 
They don't have the endowments. But their students are just as capable of learning about cybersecurity, just as capable of learning about metallurgy, all the things that are going on that provide those jobs of the future. Jill is a community college professor who teaches today as First Lady. She's long said, she's long, If I've heard it once, I've heard it a thousand times. Joe, any country that out-educates us is going to out-compete us. She'll be deeply involved in leading this effort. Thank you, Joe. Second thing we need, American Families Plan will provide access to quality, affordable child care. We guarantee When I'm proposing the legislation, we guarantee that low- and middle-income families will pay no more than 7 percent of their income for high-quality care for children up to the age of five. The most hard-pressed working families won't have to spend a dime. Third, the American Families Plan will finally provide up to 12 weeks of paid leave and medical leave, family medical leave. We're one of the few industrial countries in the world. No one should have to choose between a job and a paycheck or taking care of themselves and their loved ones or parent or spouse or child. And fourth, the American Family Plan puts directly into the pockets of millions of Americans. In March, we expanded tax credit for every child in a family up to $3,000 per child if you're under six years of age. I mean, excuse me, under, over six years of age. And $3,600 for children over six years of age. With two parents, two kids, that's $7,200 in the pockets that are going to help take care of your family. And that will help more than 65 million children and help cut child care poverty in half. And we can afford it. So we did that in the, in, the, in the last piece of legislation we passed. But let's extend that child care tax credit at least through the end of 2025. <laughs> the American Rescue Plan lowered health care premiums for 9 million Americans who buy their coverage under the Affordable Care Act. I know that's really popular this side of the aisle. <laughs> but let's make that provision permanent so their premiums don't go back up. In addition to my family's plan, I'm going to work with Congress to address this year other critical priorities for American families. The Affordable Care Act has been a lifeline for millions of Americans, protecting people with pre-existing conditions, protecting women's health. And the pandemic has demonstrated how badly, how badly it's needed. Let's lower deductibles for working families on the Affordable Care and Affordable Care Act. And let's lower prescription drug costs. We know how to do this. The last president had that as an objective. We all know how outrageously expensive drugs are in America. In fact, we pay the highest prescription drug prices of anywhere in the world, right here in America. Nearly three times for the same drug, nearly three times what other countries pay. We have to change that, and we can. Let's do what we talked about for all the years I was down here in this, in this body in Congress. Let's give Medicare the power to save hundreds of billions of dollars by negotiating lower drug prescription prices.
And by the way, it won't just, won't just help people on Medicare. Low prescription drug costs for everyone. And the money we save, which is billions of dollars, can go to strengthen the Affordable Care Act and expand Medicare coverage benefits without costing taxpayers an additional penny. It's within our power to do it. Let's do it now. We've talked about it long enough, Democrats and Republicans. Let's get it done this year. This is all about a simple premise. Health care should be a right, not a privilege in America. So, how do we pay for my jobs and family plan? I made it clear we can do it without increasing the deficits. Let's start with what I will not do. I will not impose any tax increase on people making less than $400,000. But it's time for corporate America. And the wealthiest 1% of Americans have just begun to pay their fair share. Just their fair share. Sometimes I have arguments with my friends in the Democratic Party. I think you should be able to become a billionaire and a millionaire, but pay your fair share. A recent study shows that 55 of the nation's biggest corporations paid zero federal tax last year. Those 55 corporations made in excess of $40 billion in profit. A lot of companies also evade taxes through tax havens in Switzerland or Bermuda and the Cayman Islands. And they benefit from tax loopholes and deductions for offshoring jobs and shifting profits overseas. It's not right. We're going to reform corporate taxes so they pay their fair share and help pay for the public investments their businesses will benefit from as well. We're going to reward work, not just wealth. We take the top tax bracket for the wealthiest 1% of Americans, those making over $400,000 or more, back up to where it was when George W. Bush was president, when he started, 39.6%. That's where it was when George W. was president. We're going to get rid of the loopholes, allow Americans to make more than a million dollars a year and pay a lower tax rate on their capital gains than Americans who receive a paycheck. We're only going to affect three-tenths of one percent of all Americans by that action. Three-tenths of one percent. And the IRS is going to crack down on millionaires and billionaires who cheat on their taxes. It's estimated to be billions of dollars by think tanks that are left, right, and center. I'm not looking to punish anybody. But I will not add a tax burden, additional tax burden, to the middle class in this country. They're already paying enough. I believe what I propose is fair, <laughs> fiscally responsible, and it raises revenue to pay for the plans I propose and will create millions of jobs that will grow the economy and enhance our financial standing in the country. When you hear someone say, they don't want to raise taxes on the wealthiest 1% or corporate America. Ask them whose taxes you want to raise. Instead, who's we going to cut? <laughs> Look, the big tax cut of 2017. Remember, it was supposed to pay for itself. That was how it was sold. And generate vast economic growth. Instead, it added $2 trillion to the deficit. It was a huge windfall for corporate America and those at the very top. Instead of using the tax saving to raise wages and invest in research and development, it poured billions of dollars into the pockets of CEOs. In fact, the pay gap between CEOs and their workers is now among the largest in history. According to one study, CEOs make 320 times 
what the average worker in their corporation makes. It used to be in the, below 100. The pandemic has only made things worse. 20 million Americans lost their job in the pandemic, working to middle class Americans. At the same time, roughly 650 billionaires in America saw their net worth increase by more than $1 trillion in the same exact period. Let me say it again. 650 people increased their wealth by more than $1 trillion during this pandemic. And they're now worth more than $4 trillion. My fellow Americans, trickle down. Trickle down economics has never worked. And it's time to grow the economy from the bottom and the middle out. You know, there's a broad consensus of economists left, right, and center, and they agree what I'm proposing will help create millions of jobs and generate historic economic growth. These are among the highest values investments we can make as a nation. I've often said our greatest strength is the power of our example, not just the example of our power. In my conversations with world leaders, and I've spoken over 38, 40 of them now, I've made it known, I've made it known that America's back. And know what they say? The comment I hear most of all from them? So they say, we see America's back, but for how long? But for how long? My fellow Americans, we have to show not just that we're back, but that we're back to stay, and that we aren't going to go alone. We're going to do it by leading with our allies. No one nation can deal with all the crises of our time, from terrorism to nuclear proliferation, mass migration, cybersecurity, climate change, as well as experiencing what we're experiencing now, the pandemics. There's no wall high enough to keep any virus out. And our own vaccine supply, as it grows to meet our needs, and we're meeting them, will become an arsenal for vaccines for other countries, just as America is an arsenal for democracy for the world and a consequence influence the world. But every American will have access before that occurs. Every American have access to be fully covered by COVID-19 for the vaccines we have. Look, the climate crisis is not our fight alone. It's a global fight. The United States accounts, as all of you know, less than 15 percent of carbon emissions. The rest of the world accounts for 85 percent. That's why I kept my commitment to rejoin the Paris Accord, because if we do everything perfectly, it's not going to only matter. I kept my commitment to convene a climate summit right here in America with all the major economies of the world, China, Russia, India, European Union. And I said I'd do it in my first 100 days. I want to be very blunt about it. I had a, my attempt was to make sure that the world could see there was a consensus that we are at an inflection point in history. The consensus, consensus is if we act to save the planet, we can create millions of jobs and economic growth and opportunity to raise the standard of living of almost everyone around the world. If you've watched any of it and you were all busy, I'm sure you didn't have much time. That's what virtually every nation said, even the ones that aren't doing their fair share. The investments I propose tonight also advance the foreign policy, in my view, that benefits the middle class. That means making sure every nation plays by the same rules in the global economy, including China. My discussions, in my discussion with President Xi, I told him, we welcome the competition. We're not looking for conflict. But I made absolutely clear that we will defend America's interest across the board. America will stand up to unfair trade practices that undercut American workers and American industries, like subsidies 
from state-to-state -state owned operations and enterprises, and the theft of American technology and intellectual property. I also told President Xi that we'll maintain a strong military presence in the Indo-Pacific, just as we do with NATO and Europe. Not to start a conflict, but to prevent one. I told them what I said to many world leaders, that America will not back away from our commitments, our commitment to human rights and fundamental freedoms and to our alliances. And I pointed out to him, no responsible American president could remain silent when basic human rights are being so blatantly violated. An American president, president has to represent the essence of what our country stands for. America is an idea, the most unique idea in history. We are created, all of us, equal. It's who we are. And we cannot walk away from that principle and, in fact, say we're dealing with the American idea. With regard to Russia, I know it concerns some of you, but I made very clear to Putin that we're not going to seek ex 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 excuse me, escalation, but their actions will have consequences. They turn out to be true, and they turned out to be true. So I responded directly and proportionately to Russia's interference on in our elections and the cyber attacks on our government and our business. They did both of these things, and I told them we would respond, and we have. But we can also cooperate when it's our mutual interest. We did it when we extended the New START Treaty on nuclear arms, and we're working to do it on climate change. But he understands we will respond. On Iran and North Korea, nuclear programs that present serious threats to American security and the security of the world, we're going to be working closely with our allies to address the threats posed by both of these countries. Through, di through diplomacy as well as stern deterrence. And American leadership means ending the forever war in Afghanistan. We have, we have, without hyperbole, the greatest fighting force in the history of the world. I'm the first president in 40 years who knows what it means to have a son serving in a war zone. Today, we have service members serving in the same war zone as their parents did. We have service members in Afghanistan who are not yet born on 9-11. The war in Afghanistan, as we remember the debates here, were never meant to be multi-generational undertakings of nation building. We went to Afghanistan to get terrorists. The terrorists attacked us on 9-11. And we said we would follow Osama bin Laden to the gates of hell to do it. If you've been in the upper Konar Valley, you've kind of seen the gates of hell. And we delivered justice to bin Laden. We degraded the terrorist threat of al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. And after 20 years of value, valor, and sacrifice, it's time to bring those troops home. Look. Even as we do, we'll maintain over-the-horizon capacity to suppress future threats to the homeland. And make no mistake, in 20 years, terrorism has, terrorism has metastasized. The threat has evolved way beyond Afghanistan. Those of you in the intelligence committees, the foreign relations committee, defense committees, you know well we have to remain vigilant against the threats to the United States wherever they come from. Al-Qaeda and ISIS are in Yemen, Syria, Somalia other places in Africa, in the Middle East, and beyond. And we won't ignore what our intelligence agencies have determined to be the most lethal terrorist threat to the homeland today. White supremacy is terrorism. We're not going to ignore that either. My fellow Americans, look, we have to come together to heal the soul of this nation. It was nearly a year ago before her father's funeral when I spoke with Gianna Floyd, George Floyd's young daughter.
She's a little tight, so I was kneeling down to talk to her so I could look her in the eye. She looked at me, she said, my daddy changed the world. Well, after the conviction of George Floyd's murderer, we can see how right she was if, if we have the courage to act as a Congress. We've all seen the knee of injustice on the neck of black Americans. Now's our opportunity to make some real progress. The vast majority of men and women wearing a uniform and a badge serve our communities, and they serve them honorably. I know them. I know they want to. I know they want to help meet this moment as well. My fellow Americans, we have to come together to rebuild trust between law enforcement and the people they serve, to root out systemic racism in our criminal justice system, and to enact police reform in George Floyd's name that passed the House already. I know Republicans have their own ideas and are engaged in a very productive discussions with Democrats in the Senate. We need to work together to find a consensus. But let's get it done next month by the first anniversary of George Floyd's death. The country supports this reform, and Congress should act, should act. We have a giant opportunity to bend the arc of the moral universe toward justice, real justice. And with the plans outlined tonight, we have a real chance to root out systemic racism that plagues America and American lives in other ways, a chance to deliver real equity, good jobs, good schools, affordable housing, clean air, clean water, being able to generate wealth and pass it down to generations because you have an access to purchase a house, real opportunities in the lives of more Americans, black, white, Latino, Asian Americans, Native Americans. Look, I also want to thank the United States Senate for voting 94 to 1 to pass the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act to protect Asian American and Pacific Islanders. You acted decisively. You can see on television the viciousness of the hate crimes we've seen over the past year, this past year and for too long. I urge the House to do the same and send that legislation to my desk, which I will gladly, anxiously sign. I also hope Congress will get to my desk the Equality Act to protect LGBTQ Americans. <laughs> For all transgender Americans watching at home, especially young people, who are so brave, I want you to know your president has your back. Another thing. Let's authorize the Violence Against Women Act, which has been law for 27 years. <laughs> 27 years ago, I wrote it. It'll close the act that has to be authorized now. will close the boyfriend loophole to keep guns out of the hands of abusers. The court order said this is an abuser. You can't own a gun. It's to close that loophole that existed. You know, it's estimated that 50 women are shot and killed by an intimate partner every month in America. 50 a month. Let's pass it and save some lives. And I need it. I need not tell anyone this, but gun violence has become an epidemic in America. The flag at the White House was still flying at half-mast for the eight victims of the mass shooting in Georgia, when 10 more lives were taken in the mass shooting in Colorado. And in the week in between those two events, 250 other Americans were shot dead in the streets of America. 